Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Good evening, everybody. We're going to have a little conversation tonight about kosher wine. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ian Blackburn. I'm the host of Learn About Wine and Zoom Into Wine. I'm also the wine buyer for Merchant of Wine. And hello to everybody. Um, I want to thank you for joining me on this little presentation. Uh, we've got Passover coming up, uh, but I do need to confess, I am not uh, Jewish. I've, I've uh, had a Jewish uh, family, but uh, I'm not, uh, my, my family was on the Christian side of the fence. And um, so I've always been involved in wine and I always had a lot of questions about kosher wine and I've had to do a little bit of investigation. And uh, obviously as a retail store, we want to have a good uh, selection of wines for the holidays. A lot of my clients are, are Jewish and and uh, the, uh, the Jewish religion requires that you drink wine. So uh, uh, we want to be able to provide wine for you. And uh, so we we've, we've went out and sourced some really special ones. I don't have a whole lot of them available, but I think they're a good cross section to be able to get us started and be able to talk to you intelligently about uh, the category known as kosher wine. Now, I do have a really fun little presentation here that'll take us from A to Z on that scale. But uh, I see the chat box, everyone's saying hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, and, you know, I think what's just really cool about understanding about um, kosher wine is that it, even if you're not practicing or you uh, may not be um, part of the Jewish faith, um, it's just a really nice uh, to understand the needs and the customs and and the requirements and have respect for them. So that's what I'm going to try to pass on today. Um, if I say anything that's incorrect, I'll apologize in advance, but I'm going to do my best to stay as accurate as possible. So let's get started. We're going to break right into um, our little product. We are live on, Zo on uh, our Zoom on Wine Zoom into Wine uh, Facebook page. So if you have any friends that want to uh, learn more about this, I welcome you to go to our uh, Zoom into Wine page at Wine LA. Uh, at some point in time, the Facebook page is going to be called Zoom into Wine, but the Facebook guardians have not allow us, allow us to change the name from Wine LA to Zoom into Wine yet. So um, I'll say both for right now. If you search Zoom into Wine, you'll find us though. So first, uh, let's let's talk about uh, the idea behind these wines. Um, you know, uh, kosher wine, uh, first of all, has to be made by a rabbinical staff. That's the first thing to know. You don't have a, a rabbi visiting every once in a while. This is absolutely no touchy by anyone that is not rabbinical, rabbinical staff. And there are a lot of wineries that have two winemaking facilities. They'll make a wine that isn't kosher for the world, and then they'll make a small amount of kosher wine, and they will probably isolate that equipment and or that room, and maybe even lock it off with a series of bolts and locks, because no one is uh, not part of the rabbinical staff is allowed to touch it. So they keep it very, very uh, separated from uh, the, the you know, the non-rabbinical population. So these symbols um, all stand for basically the same thing. Um, that they are kosher and they follow the kosher laws and rules and um, are mavushal. Uh, and, and the mavushal laws um, elevate the wine from being a kosher wine to being servable at a, uh, a high holiday. Okay, now Mavushal wine has been actually uh, boiled in a, a Mavushal process. It could be flash pasteurization where the fruit sees high heat for a short period of time and bakes off um, um, anything that is undesirable for the kosher status of the wine or the wine is literally boiled. And this is a, um, a requirement of a Mavushal wine. And that would allow someone who's not uh, practicing uh, to touch the wine. 
Uh, so if uh, you're in a restaurant, you'd want to have wines that are mavushal uh, because someone who is not kosher or um, of the, the uh, Jewish faith, if they were to touch that bottle of wine, it would not be servable, okay? So mavushal is a very important category to fall into if, if uh, the, any of those boxes are gonna be checked. And quite honestly, it's very difficult to promise that the wine wouldn't be touched. Um, so a lot of the wines for the high holidays are, are absolutely mavushal. And they carry these different marks and may also read on the bottle, um, suitable for high holidays, suitable for Jewish holidays, suitable be served um, at ceremonial events. But the combination of kosher and mavushal are critical. So that being said, um, on our PowerPoint, there is a set of Jewish uh, religious dietary laws called kashrut, and they are the kind of the overseeing laws of uh, kosher production. And um, there are strict wine additive rules as well during the winemaking production. You can't add anything to the wine that isn't uh, kosher as well. So um, there's a lot of different ingredients that we may choose to use in, in wine production that we'd have to be very restrictive and the r rabbis would only use kosher products or add additives and uh, they wouldn't use any uh, animal byproducts now some people throw their hands up and say wait they've used the animal byproducts in wine well uh, there are practices of adding egg whites uh, which are actually okay um, they're a protein and they helps uh, basically fine in uh, the wine, find the wine softening, the tannins, and also kind of cleaning the wine. Um, but there's uh, other types of animal proteins that are maybe also used as fining agents, things like diatomaceous earth, which are fish bones, and and uh, sometimes we use different types of in glass um, uh, to help with the filtration or uh, casein, which is a dietary derivative, or gelatin, which is an animal derivative. So all of these things could be used in the filtration of, of wine in a regular winery. Uh, they don't actually have to tell you what they do. And uh, the industry has been cleaning itself up in a way where they want to be very transparent. And if they are doing things that allow them to be, um, uh, uh, let's say um, maybe able to promote themselves as vegan. That's a that's a new newer thing on wine to be promoted as vegan. And so many of the kosher wines, although they do allow for egg white finding, um, that many of the, the kosher wines uh, uh, follow a lot of those same vegan guidelines, um, and depending or not if they use egg whites. So um, kosher. Uh, produced in a manner that is approved in the accordance of Jewish dietary laws. Okay, and that's the cash route that we were talking about before. Handled only by religious Jews during winemaking. And, uh, th and that is so strict. I just cannot enforce how strict that is. Um, there's no sharing of the equipment, no touching of any of the wine by anyone that's not part of that. Um, rabbinical staff, no animal-based additives, um, kosher for Passover. Um, there are wines that are made kosher all year round. Some wines are just kosher and that uh, can be served every day of the year, except for high holidays. And then for the high holidays, they may have a higher standard with higher costs. And the thought is if you wanted to make just buy a regular kosher wine for a non-kosher holiday, you could save some money and just buy a kosher wine. Whereas a wine made for the Passover, the higher holidays has even higher standards, higher costs. And uh, so you might find both wines available. Just be careful when you're in the store and you're checking out the kosher wine selection. Um, then there's the kosher le mahidrin. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, mahadrin. Um, and if any of you want to correct my pronunciation, I would love it. 
uh, which is wines uh, in which the rules of Kashrat have been uh, stringently approved. Uh, and Mavusha wines, flash pasteurized or flash detente is another way of saying the same thing. Method of, of kosher wine. That's a heat or flashing of, with heat, a quick boiling. Um, and then there's wines that are sacramental wine, kiddish wines that are typically sweet kosher wines, generally of low quality, such as Manischewitz, which a lot of people, I think Manischewitz is the the kosher wine that people first discover, and then they immediately say, oh, kosher wines are good. And uh, so I'm here to tell you, there are some great kosher wines. One of my favorites, Laurent Perrier Champagne, is made with kosher standards, and uh, they may make a couple, so be careful, but I do believe that all Laurent Perrier non-vintage champagne is kosher and uh, they don't make a big deal about it, but that's a that's a pretty significant brand and, and, and that's important. Um, I was able to personally visit um, a winery up in the Napa Valley recently, um, um, owned by the Marciano brothers, who uh, successfully sold their guest jeans empire for quite a fortune and uh, purchased and developed a wine brand up in Napa Valley and they make um, a good amount of wine for uh, public sale, um, but they also have a separate facility just for kosher winemaking. Um, the family is kosher, and uh, so their their colt wine is literally their kosher wine because the the really you know uh, affluent uh, kosher population knows how good that wine is, and they will pay up for it. So that is approximately $400 to $500 a bottle and represents a local example, but also the Rothschilds in, in Bordeaux um, are involved in making some really nice kosher wines that are also Mavushal and um, those are some famous brands, but there are lots of different kosher producers and we're gonna try three of them tonight. And in fact, we're gonna get started and I can't wait to try it because I drink this all year long and I will tell you, I think some people may like be surprised to find out that this wine is kosher. This is Baxberg and the Baxberg family in South Africa is uh, one of the leading producers in South Africa and I carry quite a few of their wines. Um, I think they represent a tremendous value. Not all their wines are kosher. However, uh, the sparkling wine that I carry from Baxberg is, and I would uh, recommend this at any point in time, and is, uh, this is just, has the highest of standards. Um, the, the father uh, of, of, of the winery, the, the, the gentleman who had, um, founded Baxberg, um, a very, very generous man, created quite a few uh, charitable efforts, has a lot of ethos, and always does a lot of different things for the local population. But um, he also celebrates uh, kosher holidays. And um, and so he wanted to have some of his wine qualify. So as a rabbinical staff to come in and make the wine for the family because he's not rabbinical, okay? And uh, so it's 100% kosher mavushal, pasteurized. And it is also uh, made under the certifications of the Cape Town Beth Din, or OU, the Orthodox Union of the United States. A, it's a fresh, low alcohol Chardonnay based wine that they produced uh, as a primary fermentation. And then the juice is pasteurized uh, using flash pasteurization techniques. And then it goes into the bottle. Um, and it goes through the Cape Classique uh, method of sparkling, which is very similar to champagne, uh, bottle fermentation, and, um, and has some time requirements as well. But uh, this is gonna be a very nice bottle of wine and uh, everyone that's doing the Zoom with me tonight has got a bottle. So if you haven't already opened it, um, I'm gonna open it with you. 
I expose the cage. Um, I always teach people to open the sparkling wine, counting one, two, three, four, five, and a half turns, opens up the cage. I keep the cage on the top of the bottle just to hold on to it because the cork can be slick. And then I turn the base of the bottle. Put your hand at the bottom of the bottle, hold the cork, and turn the bottom of the bottle, not the cork. And the cork will want to come right out. All right. So this is the Baxberg Kosher Method Cape Classique Brut, meaning dry. Mm. Beautiful nose, got a little toasted brioche, a lot of that Chardonnay, baked apple, bruised apple, baked pear. Quite spicy, a lot of brown spice. Mm. It's a pretty rich, um, that's a big mouthful of wine. Um, really delicious, round, almost a creamy sensation. Mm. which um, in the production of sparkling wine, which um, often champagne is thought of as the guiding light of sparkling wine. I mean, in fact, the Champenois were not the first to make sparkling wine, but they did um, perfect the method for making sparkling wine. And one of the rules in making sparkling wine and champagne, one of the many rules, in fact, is that it's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. So this particular version, which would account for quite a, 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 a rich color, somewhere between pink and, and gold. It's actually beautiful. Um, it's got kind of a, a, um, a lively a pink hue to this golden color of wine. And so I looked at it twice when it came out of the bottle and I said, I just said it was Chardonnay. And as I look at the back of this bottle, it actually says, um, and I'm sure yours does too, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes. I will say that the Chardonnay definitely seems uh, prevalent in the wine, except for in that color, but uh, really nice texture, weight, concentration, um, elevated quality here, and uh, wonderful uh, flavor profile. And that's why I said I drink this around all year long, not, e not, not even concerned if this is kosher or not. I actually think it's a really good sparkling wine. And I, I've sold this wine to uh, many people that are looking for something that's got some good healthy ethos is, that competes with champagne, that has a, a slightly softer price point, but has a lot of really good qualities about it. Now, everything he does at Baxberg is certified organic, certified sustainable, really pressing on those ethos buttons, trying to keep things as fresh and as healthy and sustainable as possible. Um, and this is a, a really nice map of all of the famous areas of South Africa. Um, and uh, I've been in South Africa on two occasions and it's one of my favorite uh, wine regions to visit. I have a friend down there who has uh, received me and toured me around. Um, I wouldn't go down there without him. His name is Chris. If you ever wanna to go to South Africa, I'll hook you up with him. He's absolutely a must because he lives there and he speaks Afrikaans and he can read the, the damn signs on the road because everything's in Dutch, Afrikaans, and there are 27 letter names on the streets and some streets don't even have names. They're dirt roads and they say turn at the rock and the stone and the tree and the, the you know, that kind of stuff. So you can get lost pretty easily driving around South Africa if you're going wine tasting. Um, but uh, he has always got kept us on time and kept us safe because he's a big uh, former military officer as well. He knows his way around the roads and his, he, he pretty, feel pretty safe around Chris. Let's just put it that way. Now, this is the Baxberg uh, family that uh, make the wine, Simon Back and his father. And uh, they, they've had this long tradition of making various, uh, very uh, ethos friendly wines and and the, and the value proposition that they present are very, very good. Um, I have their Chenin Blanc, I have um, their Cabernet, 
and I have their Pinotage. And I will tell you that it's probably the only brand I have more than one wine from. Maybe I have a couple that I have two wines, but the fact that I have four wines from them, it's just really hard to compete with the value proposition that they bring to the table. Their Pinotage is fantastic. Their Chenin Blanc, wonderful. And uh, they just really deliver a lot of value for the money. Um, and then uh, I don't see a lot of competing Cape Classic method sparkling wines coming in. Um, and then especially one that carries a kosher designation. So this one just is easy to carry because it checks so many boxes. And I hope you enjoy it. Um, retails for less than $30. I'm really enjoying the biscuity nature of the wine. It's got a little bit of time on the lees. Um, it's got a wonderful brioche toastiness. And uh, Aaron, what do you think of it? I really liked it. Um, I'm getting back into the practice of tasting wines. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not quite a professional, but yeah, I really enjoyed, um, I love the gold color and I really enjoyed that kind of toasty bit you know, just at the end uh, when I when I tried it. And did you notice that little pink hue amongst the gold too? Because when, just, I, when, when I saw that come out of the bottle, yeah. I was like, wait a second, they're, how are they <laughs> pink? Yeah, yeah, I, I, it was just like a slight, yeah, just a twinge of pink at the end. Yeah, it's, it's really subtle and it's like a flash of pink. But mm -hmm. um, if you look at it long enough, you can kind of see that pink hue to it. And now it's just a little bit of time on the Pinot skins and give it a little bit of that fleshiness and that weight and that mouthfeel. And uh, I, I just think they find ways to make the wine a little bit more delicious, a little more tactile. Um, and this is just really wonderfully done. I'm going to move out of uh, the sparkling wine. So I'd encourage you, if you have a way to put that in the refrigerator, come back to that. Um, over the next day. Um, if you keep it really still, you can just put a cork in the top of the bottle. Um, if you uh, got it, don't put that in the refrigerator door, however, because then it'll be swinging all around and a cork will blow off the bottle. But you might need to uh, put a special um, uh, kind of a sparkling top on top of the bottle to capture that pressure and to keep it for a day or so if you're not gonna drink it tonight but it's a good uh, wine for brunch tomorrow. I think that's what I'm gonna do with it. And I'm gonna move into our wine number two tonight, which is going to be um, actually uh, our Castal La Vie Blanc. Um, <clears throat> this is made in Israel. Now, um, some people think Israel, oh, then the wine's gotta be kosher, and that's not necessarily true. Um, there are non-kosher wines, and, and there's a lot of wines in Israel that are not mavushal, so be careful. But um, uh, it is, uh, uh, this one is kosher and vegan, also um, mavushal as well, and carries on the back of the bottle a number of the markations that we were um, looking at before. But this is a really unique wine um, of Israel. It is Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and Gewürztraminer blended together and uh, ha creates a really nice nose to the wine um, and makes a very fun fruit-oriented type of expression. Uh, this wine is uh, made in the Judea region. These are the different appellations in Israel. And here's a look at the vineyards. Gorgeous look at the vineyards. Quite inland, quite warm. Um, there's definitely a coastal impact. There's a very Mediterranean sensation about these wines. Sun drenched and uh, certainly warm enough in the summer to create quite a bit of, um, of ripeness. The aromatic mixture of grape varieties that they're using in this particular blend um, make it quite elevated in the glass. And um, I think uh, when, if we were to have tasted this blind, we could maybe 
stir this wine around, smell it, take a look. You see this color that's pretty golden. Um, this is a 2017, so it's got a couple of years on it, but it doesn't look to be old. It just looks to be pretty um, um, in, in touch with oxygen. So maybe it's barrel plus a little time that's brought this golden color. I do smell some wood in the in the in the nose of the wine, but there's this really um, bold and significant aromatic uh, um, spice and floral and uh, lychee nut. Um, it's co quite complex. And um, I think this wine is very uh, accessible for a lot of people. I think a lot of people would find it interesting. It is also dry. It is not sweet. Although that floral note in the nose and that all that that lychee and that uh, different character that you smell, you might start thinking that, hey, this might have a sweet mouthfeel, but it really is uh, uh, quite dry. And here's a look at the, the barrel program. And uh, this wine does see some time in wood. And especially with the use of Chardonnay 45%, there's about 50% uh, Sauvignon Blanc in this particular vintage and five Gewürztraminer. And they did use some uh, time on fine lees after uh, the fermentation was over uh, to help uh, evoke you a little bit more of that mouthfeel, probably because this wine's so aromatic, they needed to kind of balance it out with a little bit of mouthfeel, a little bit of weight in the mouth. And answer any questions, take a look in our chat and see what people are asking. Um, if you have any co comments or questions, let me know. Satsuko, thanks for joining us in Japan. Um, I know that there's a few people watching us on Facebook tonight. I have some friends out there that uh, are doing that and I thank them for joining us. Um, but the chat box is just for those of us on the Zoom. Today was absolutely gorgeous Los Angeles uh, day. I kept thinking that it might rain. I heard rain maybe uh, on its way. Um, it never uh, materialized. We had amazing blue skies, crisp air, and uh, temperatures in the high 60s. Just a really nice day. I got a lot done. Um, it was a little bit like Christmas today for me because uh, one of my Christmas presents finally arrived. Um, I've been waiting for my uh, um, Peloton bike and I got it today, got it set up. I got to do my first spin class in over a year. So i um, very happy about that. And, um, and at the same time, I ordered a barbecue because uh, I broke my barbecue last year. I was using it so much and it finally arrived. So it was like un unwrapping a couple of really big fun presents today. Um, the barbecue I got is pretty exciting and it burns uh, little wood chips and it is uh, got its own app. I mean, it's this thing like you could drive it from your computer. Uh, so it's pretty exciting and I'll be making some really amazing slow roasted smoky ribs very soon. Me some smoked salmon on that thing first actually i got some some hickory wood and some cherry wood uh chips for it so it's gonna be a lot of fun all right we're gonna move into our red wine now which is a, a brand that i've been familiar with for a while and it's called tulip and tulip is a award-winning um red wine producer in israel so a little um, newer energy here, 2003, they were established younger. Um, they came with some modern ideas, modern education, um, uh, definitely um, had some goals of elevating the category. And they've been doing that for many, many years. And I've tasted this wine in a couple different competitions. Um, I usually find out at the end, obviously, when, um, when we're done that we just had the tulip wine and it's won many of the competitions that i've participated in in tasting kosher category wines so um the opportunity to get this wine came and um, 
we're able to to feature that as our our star wine and i would pour this for anyone that's looking for a really nice cabernet um something different i would pour it for friends in in a blind flight to see if they, if they could tell it's cabernet from a place that's not bordeaux or california or washington and we're going to take a look inside the glass and see what we see and taste but this is from galilee um and in fact, is a carry upper Galilee appellation on the bottle. It just says Galilee, I think. And um, it carries upper Gal. Or it says just Galilee on the bottle, so it's could be either or a blend of both. Some nice uh, photos of the place. A look at the vineyards. Now, in when the wine's made in Israel, there's actually a whole other set of rules, um, and they have. Uh, kosher wine conditions of growth and so they take the growth uh, rules back to biblical times and um, these are some obviously some pretty old wine laws so for the first three years the fruit from the vine may not be used for winemaking and only in the fourth year is the winery permitted to use the grapes Growing other fruits between the vines is prohibited. So this is something that you might find um, in other regions of the, of the world. Um, some some places grow different crops. Uh, I'm not sure if legumes would would be. It says fruits, so it doesn't say legumes. But we do use a lot of legumes in the plantings uh, here in California. Uh, when we turn those into the soil, they create a lot of uh, nutritional value for the soils. So I wonder if uh, legumes would uh, be prohibited too, but I doubt it. It says fruit. Every seven years, probably this is the most expensive one, but every seven years, the fields are left fallow, uh, allowed to rest. And uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a pretty interesting one. And it's really uh, as much about uh, you know, uh, understanding the sacrifices that are necessary and um, and having those kind of standards in life. So um, it's there. It's 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 a very very. I I I I don't know if if you had three vineyards, maybe one vineyard, one strip of land could go down fallow, fallow, and then the next year another strip of land could go down. So you could rotate it around. Um, that would make a lot of sense, and it does look like um, they do some negotiation there to be able to keep it economically sustainable. But um, that, that just know that that is a practice every seven years that the, a vineyard or field has to be left fallow. Over one percent of the production is poured away um, as part of the tithing process as well so quite a few, quite a few economic implications involved there a couple photos from the vineyard team let's taste this together and see how this this beautiful cabernet is doing i i look at this uh, deeply colored thick skinned grape varietal red wine swirl it around um it's a 2014 reserve by the way and uh, did get some really nice accolades. When I look at the wine in the glass, it, it does appear to have a few years of age on it, but um, in pretty good shape. And when I smell, you definitely get that nice, uh, wow, this, this, this fruit has smelt, uh, seen some sunshine. Um, it has a nice balance of earth, a little bit of parazines, um, and uh, fruit, uh, whereas a wine is grown in a cooler climate would be a little bit more earth oriented. This has a little bit of that sun drenched element to it. It's quite uh, um, desirable. It smells beautiful. It makes my mouth water just smelling it. Cabernet, if you were to tell me that we were going to drink a Cabernet and I was uh, forced to give a blind tasting note, on Cabernet. Typically you'd think of smells and aromas like cassis, um, you know, dark cherry, red fruits, black fruits, blue fruits, depending on 
what kind of zone it's grown in. I would think this would be towards the red fruit character uh, with the Mediterranean. Um, you do tend to use quite a bit of wood on these wines, so oak barrel thyme. Um, I smell a little bit of wood in the in the form of vanilla, uh, a little bit of that wood green. You get a little bit of that cassis, eucalyptus, mint, um, kind of some classic nuances there. Um, while the wine is made with some modern techniques, it is not so modern that it's moved towards a really high alcohol style. This carries 14% alcohol. And I might have, I might have guessed just a little bit higher. I thought maybe 14.5 or so, because I get this like really neat, um, it's a kind of not quite reduction, but it's just got a little bit of waff of like salt air, um, salted kind of uh, that sea air um, element to it. It's quite complex. I think I am. Um, just smelling it makes my mouth kind of go into defensive mode thinking here comes some tannin because I'm going to get walloped with this big uh, f uh, flavor. So my, my tongue is kind of uh, uh, salivating and getting ready for that. It's got really good balance. We're in a full state that the wine's in right now. The wine being six, seven years old. Um, it's kind of an optimal moment to drink it. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of a briny character for sure. Sierra brininess. And you got that in the white, you said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can I could see that. It's got so much floral that that would maybe be the second player. Whereas here from a good couple inches away, I'm getting the kind of the smell, the smells of a little bit of wood um, with some vanilla. I'm getting a little bit of that age popping out of the glass some wonderful balance of eucalyptus and spices and those classic Cabernet nuances. But that salt air, that Mediterranean kind of sun-drenched ocean air element is right there at the top, which I love, by the way. I have a bizarre percentage of wines that come from islands on our, our website, places like Sicily and Sardinia and uh, even uh, the Greek islands and, uh, you know, uh, certainly New Zealand. Um, but um, they, I love wines that have that oceanic influence um, is that that sea air, that, that's kind of that, that umami set that comes with it too, kind of seaweed umami set that kind of influences the wine uh, smell and flavor. I, I think it even makes it more food applicable. Um, I, I eat a lot of different Asian spiced foods and I love how that, that kind of nuance kind of grasps into the different Asian cultures with food and wine. And um, I think this wine really has quite a few different applications. You know, obviously a big hearty red wine you're probably looking at something off of the grill, grill marks, or uh, a stew, um, something with a pretty heavy, uh, doesn't have to be protein. I don't want to say it's got to be a steak. I, I, I think there's a lot of wonderful things you could do with like eggplant and, and uh, uh, tofus and things like that. But I would, um, probably stay away from a lot of heavy spice with this wine. I would keep it into kind of a Mediterranean state of mind. I would play around potentially with like, you know, some different types of uh, uh, grilled items or stewed items. I would love it personally with some lamb. I think it would be really good with a, a lamb kebab type of a dish. Um, maybe some couscous, some uh, some hummus, something like that. I, I tend to blend all the Mediterranean foods onto one plate um, with a wine like this. Let's take a look at the website and uh, some of the wines that we have here tonight. Um, 
when we look at our event, if you're looking for any of these things, you could click through off of the website here. You should be able to click onto the wines. Maybe that doesn't work right now. So we're gonna go up here and grab that and just take a look at our store through the search bar, which I use every single day. It's just a really handy feature on Shopify. And uh, we can click right in and find any of the wines. If you wanted to find uh, you know, anything that's kosher, you could just put in the kosher word and that probably finds everything that we've got tonight because these are the only kosher wines I have. So here's our Baxberg, $29.95, less than 30 bucks. I think uh, I'm gonna create a wine note after tasting this wine, really celebrating just how um, up-tempo this wine is. It's got a lot of character to it. It's got a fantastic balance of color with that spray of, of kind of that pink hue, uh, reflecting its use of Pinot Noir. Um, there's a little bit of barrel used in the, in the uh, fermentation of the Chardonnay giving it a little bit more personality. So it's a really pretty big and dynamic sparkling wine with a lot of finesse and a lot of flavor. Now I will tell you this too, I put this wine on my website and probably everybody that's bought this wine is from South Africa so far. I've got a great South African clientele buying this wine, promoting it. And um, it, it's a wine that they all trust and it's a wine that they were excited to see here. It's not a big production only 20 or so cases come to California. So you're not gonna find it in a lot of places, but I definitely would recommend uh, looking into it. And if you wanna learn more about the Baxberg brand, we had a Zoom with the Baxberg family um, a while back, and uh, that should be findable on our blog, right down at the bottom of our thing here. You go in here, in here and see our uh, Zoom and Wine archive. Here's the Castel La Vie. And that blend uh, again with Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc and Gewürztraminer around $20. And then again, for under finding the kosher category wines, so you just search for kosher. And there's our uh, Tulip Cabernet around 30 bucks. This wine, um, Honestly, a lot of the wines that we're, we're buying here, we, we started purchasing uh, when the pandemic closed down a lot of the on-premise on or restaurant trade. A lot of these wines, um, like this one here, were um, kind of put into reserve program for restaurants to have something that's ready to drink. If you're running a restaurant program, you're excited to find something with a little bit of bottle age to it. Um, and then, you know, with the pandemic, um, the uh, uh, closing of the restaurants and month, not month one, month two, month three, but finally the distributor said, hey, these restaurants are gonna be closed for a while. We cannot carry all this inventory. And they started shedding some of these uh, reserve items and uh, we were able to pick them up for a, a very good price. And we share that price because this bottle of wine should be close to $50. And I think it, it shows like it's a, a higher quality, higher caliber wine. Um, as do the others. I really enjoy this Cabernet. It's a pretty strong score from the wine enthusiast as well, back a few years. But uh, when we look into our Zoom in the Wine calendar, we're producing uh, two events per week right now. And we're kind of uh, celebrating tonight, relaxing, uh, more casual presentation. We had over 125 people uh, view our stars of Cabernet last week and uh, kept us quite busy. This Wednesday, we have a really awesome Zoom with one of my favorite winemakers, Matt Dees from up in Santa Barbara will be on the Zoom with us. Uh, he's uh, one of the, the top guys in the state of California and certainly in Santa Barbara. And he's got big uh, expectations put upon him because of the projects that he oversees. Uh, Mail Road, Kimsey, he's the winemaker for Honada, The Hilt, and a lot of top wines there in Santa Barbara. And um, the, these two wines are um, 
have a lot of sym symmetry to them and we're going to learn all about them and i've always been a huge fan of the wines coming off of the carmel mountain vineyard um that's run by the carmelite nuns and uh, it's just a really cool vineyard to learn about the brewer clifton team used to make these wines for a long time and uh I would say that this is, if it's not the best Chardonnay in the state of California, it's up there. It's really, really phenomenal stuff. He makes Chardonnay and Pinot Noir under Mail Road. And uh, then the, Kims, the Kimsey family owns this really special vineyard in Ballard Canyon, where he makes Grenache and Syrah for the Kimseys. And, uh, and my friend, Bob, Chef Bob Blummer is gonna be on the Zoom from the Food Network to talk about fava beans because it's the only green th leafy th thing that we could think of to bring in for, uh, we're competing with St. Patrick's Day for Pete's sake with wine. So we're doing uh, fava beans and, uh, and Bob's got this great fava bean recipe that he's bringing to the equation and showing off. And it's something that he uh, learned from Nancy Silverton and her days at Campanile. And so Bob's going to kind of take a look at that recipe and show how easy it is to make something delicious with fava beans from the farmer's market. So check that out on Wednesday. If you still want to uh, do the Napa Valley thing with us next Friday and Saturday, it's our night three and four. You could buy one night or both or, you know, anytime we do a stars event, there are multiple nights and um, we have a lot of fun with them. We have seven different wineries per night. Um, these are not for the meek, however, they've been going over 90 minutes and uh, we are tasting seven really amazing wines uh, north of over $600 a night in wine that's being tasted um, uh, for the 50, I think it's $59 a ticket. Um, you could do the combo both nights for 89 bucks for stars of cab or stars of napa and then we've got this really cool little port program coming up and there's some added things that are going to be coming on here on the 24th um i was um very uh flattered to be included in a movie called a perfect vintage and it's getting a um a award consideration up at the sonoma uh, movie um uh, I think it's called the Sonoma Film Festival. And um, that starts on the 24th. So we're gonna have the production team and the stars of that movie on our port Zoom, because it's all about vintage port. And um, we're going to talk to them about making that movie, its appearance in the, in the Sonoma Film Festival. But you'll also have a chance to watch the movie or buy a ticket to the Sonoma Film Festival, which is entirely online. And then you have about four days to watch unlimited numbers of movies for the Sonoma Film Festival. Uh, I believe watching The Perfect Vintage costs around $12, but it's the only way to watch it right now is through the film festival. Um, at some point in time, they do hope to be in a movie theater with that film, but uh, really cool, relevant, a wine movie, a uh, lot of wine personalities in it. And I got to make an appearance uh, I'm, I'm usually left on the cutting room floor. Uh, so I was really happy to hear that they used the, the meeting with me. It was very nice. Um, we'll go to Spain and learn a little bit about Mentia. Um, uh, one of my, I, my long picks in the world of grapes is that people are all gonna be talking about the wines of Mentia in about 10 years. I think probably some people thought that about 10 years ago, it's just really starting to happen and the wines are get so good. Um, the town is called Bersco, and it is uh, Mentia grape, and it's just an amazing grape, and I, I can only explain it in the easiest possible format of the time we have, saying it's, if you like Pinot Noir, or you like Grenache, you're gonna like Mencia. It's right there in between the two, and really got a lot of attitude and makes some really cool wines. And we're just developing this calendar um, every day, spending more and more time trying to get it further and further out in front of us, which is sometimes difficult with some of these big events, but we're just posting our stars of Italian wine coming up in April. Um, 
And so just to show you where we're going, all these things are happening. And last week we, um, or two weeks ago, we, we got our Learn About Wine site up and running again. The classes are starting to flow. Uh, you're gonna see a bunch of new classes start to appear very soon here. Um, these are some of our classics. Um, we continue to offer those, but we're gonna be bringing on more educators and having more experiences at Learn About Wine. With that, uh, check out the Facebook page and share the video with our friends tonight. Um, everyone that's on the Zoom tonight gets a special discount on these wines. If you want them delivered, we'll be delivering on Tuesday. Delivery in the city of LA is free on these wines. Um, it's $50 minimum to get that free delivery, but we do have free delivery in LA or $10 delivery if you just need one bottle. Um, $10 anywhere in the state of California for up to a case of wine. So um, don't know that we can make it any less expensive um, on the delivery side. And uh, we really want to earn your business. We also give you 5% um, off when you order six bottles and 10% off when you order 12. And so uh, it's really hard to compete with our prices. Um, uh, some places that have stores have some wines that are uh, a little more grocery oriented. Our wines are typically not found in grocery stores. They're from smaller producers. And um, I don't know why I'm sharing that screen right there, but uh, we do have a, a lot going on in our little wine world and we appreciate your time and hope that you'll keep coming back and, and I'm here to ask, answer any questions you might have about the kosher category. Uh, let me know if there's anything else that uh, I can answer. Aaron, you asked about um, if memory serves correct. Brut is somewhere right in the middle, just before extra brut, after brut, uh, uh, extra, I'm sorry, brut, extra brut, after extra brut, it gets sweeter. Right, so there are different levels. There are no dose uh, wines, meaning no dosage, um, that uh, might be called brut zero might be called uh, uh, ultra brute. Uh, there's, um, or some people are just saying no dose. Um, and uh, so this wine does have a small dosage. It stays, I believe under 12 grams, 12 being the number that would be considered brute in champagne. But in South Africa might not be all that high. I'm not quite sure. The ripeness level on this wine, uh, it does definitely feels riper than a champagne, but I think that works in its favor in some regards too, because it's a little bit bigger and rounder and um, um, bigger mouthfeel uh, on this wine than I would say a, a champagne that would finish with a much more higher acid profile. Um, and then there are sec levels, uh, demi-sec and sec. Uh, or off dry. Some people call them, uh, you know, the uh, brute extra, like you said, or extra brute. I, I do get a little confused sometimes between uh, uh, the ultra brute and the uh, extra dry category, which sounds like it should be drier, but it's actually sweeter than brute. Right. So um, be careful there. If, if you like a little bit of residual, though, those can be those can be uh, um, rewarding at the right moment with some spicy food. Yeah, do you think you'll ever get into uh, Spanish kosher wines? Um, I know that they're there and I know some of them uh, are pretty prevalent. If you have any recommendations for me, um, I can certainly find them. Um, there might be a, a perfect moment uh, for us to, to talk Spanish kosher, but uh, um, I, uh, I, I quite honestly couldn't name one without uh, looking really hard. Do you have a favorite? I, I do, but I can't name it right now. Yeah. Um, um, but well, if you think of it, just let me know because yeah, I'm sure, sure they're there. I'm sure they're there. Just, uh, you know, whether it gets all the way here to California and it's, I'm, I'm sure they're there though. There's, there's a, a company that sells only kosher wine of the world and they've got like a hundred different wineries so it's out I've, there. I've been to the spain wine show in la and they're there yeah it's just uh and the one that i like is, is already repped but the, there are there are others 
that were there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I uh, I have no hesitation of if I like the wine and it's made available to us and we can use wine in that category. I probably will keep a, a fairly contained kosher category to a couple of whites and a couple of reds. I I have enough room in my store for about four or five hundred SKUs, and um, um, you know the kosher category. If I have five or six SKUs, that's probably as much as I can afford to um, to maintain in that category. But I but I'm I'm always looking for what's best to carry. So if you find one that you love, let me know. But I'll, look, I'll keep looking around, Tony. I love seeing the um, different wines that you have. I used to work at a wine store back in New York and they had like, you know, the Concord grape wine, the kosher wine. And that's the, that, that and like one other brand is the only thing that they had. And, you know, I kind of felt bad for the people who came in asking for kosher wine and that was the only thing we could provide for them. So this is really awesome that we have other selections. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, the, you know, stuff like Manischewitz is pretty um, commercial and it's you know made in an interesting way. One, one thing I, I found out about that is that when they make Manischewitz, they, um, there's time of the year where they make it uh, kosher and then there's a time of the year that they make it Mavushal and they do separate the two as um, I, I believe that the the uh, kosher laws, because uh, with the uh, Manischewitz, they do add sugar to make that wine. And I think that the kosher wine can use like um, regular sugar, whereas the, um, the, the, the Mavushal level needs it to be a, a higher level of quality and it really increases the cost of that wine. And I uh, could have got that story a little bit off, but I think that's one of the major, major differences is that uh, they're able to make it mavushal, they have to use the very, very high, highest end ingredients. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's a little more expensive. Yeah, that is interesting. And yet I, that kind of makes sense because I don't know if they use like bleached granulated sugar because in the bleaching process, they use animal bones to make it white. So, you know, if they're using bleached uh, sugar to do that, um, then, you know, the kosher thing probably would be out the window. Okay, so here's maybe, I'm, I'm starting to remember something. I think it was corn syrup that they used to make uh, the regular, and then when it's mavushal, they're using raw sugar. Gotcha, yep. Well, that makes no sense. corn syrup for, for <laughs> you know, corn syrup. <laughs> yep. That, 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 again, could be a uh, checked up against the wall and uh, be proven wrong. But I just kind of try to remember the conversation. It was many years ago. We had a, uh, when I was uh, staying for the Master of Wine, and we had a presentation on uh, uh, Manischewitz. Because Masters of Wine, you have to know about everything, not not just expensive wine. You have to know about all wine. And all so uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting to learn. And it, it, it's amazing how much uh, wine they make. From the in the in the state of New York for Manischewitz with, with Concord grape, that is a lot of wine. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big and valid category, and uh, it's certainly getting more attention than ever before. Um, uh, but uh, the selections are sometimes a little strained. So you know, I'll try to always find the best possible option. I will say when you know when the the harbor stopped really getting a lot of importation coming in the selections of op, you know the number of options came dwindling down in a hurry um so we staked our claim pretty early on as to what we were going to try to get in stock and we had pretty good stocks on these wines so um take take a take your time if you need any for the high holidays we hope to have them for you and i uh, hope that you like the selection tonight and uh, if you find any others that you love, let me know. We're always happy to source them for you. And um, we love to make sh make ourselves aware of, of the best of breed in their category. Mm -hmm. Tony, you're in the desert tonight. Yep, I'm in Palm Springs. How is the temperature out there today? Yeah, it was, yesterday it was freezing. Today, it's, um, we got up to 72, I think. 
Nice. And um, and then Monday it drops right right back down. <laughs> Aaron, where's home for you tonight? I am in Santa Maria. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're a, a you're a wine country. Are you are you involved in the agriculture? I am not. I. Uh, I'm actually in uh, life insurance. I work for New York Life. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, um, some some of my favorite strawberries up there in Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry's Berries. Have you ever heard of those guys? Yes. Yep. I've heard of them. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, really good. They're so expensive. I, they're, they're literally a part of our, our monthly food budget is how much we can buy in Harry's Berries. So, <laughs> um, but they're our special treat. And nice. That's yeah, uh, good. Vineyard up there. It's a very. It's like a vineyard that's, that's on a uh, sand dune. Oh wow! Very interesting up there. I've been able to visit the Biancito family on a couple of times. The Millers. Uh, yeah, they, I used to work. Uh, I used to. Do, I repped them for a while. Oh, did you? Yeah. Sixteen hundred acres. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Some of it planted in the early nineteen seventies. Uh, just really amazing. But um, uh, kosher is um, becoming more specialized and, um, and hopefully uh, we'll continue to find some really unique selections at, at Merchant Wine. So thanks for cool. joining me. You guys Thank have you. a good uh, weekend. Enjoy your Saturday night. And uh, up at Setsuko in Japan, thanks for joining us tonight. Hope you had a good time. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.